In today's video, we're going to reassemble the Spicer 18 transfer case. If you'd like to see the video on disassembly, please check the link in the description. Since the last time we met, I completely prepped the case, cleaned, primed, and prepared all the parts for reassembly. I'll be using the Miner Overhaul Kit from Kaiser Willys. Don't let the word Miner fool you, it's very comprehensive. Um, so the first thing you're going to notice is this really nice intermediate shaft with O-rings and machined in the end says made in the USA. These are tested for hardness and they're an excellent uh, part for your transfer case to last a very long time. Obviously you get all new seals, felts, and gaskets to keep it leak free. This is the front ball bearing and the pilot bushing for the four-wheel drive shaft. The little bag includes all the intermediate bearings, all new snap rings, thrust washers, um, the little detent balls, all the little parts that you need. Then it comes with a nice set of Koyo bearings. These are made in Japan, um, which as you know, Japan um, has very high quality bearings. I've run them in all my Jeeps for years. So that's the inner bearing and the outer race. So that kind of wraps up the minor overhaul kit. One thing I like to add to this kit are the output flanges. These are something we don't often think about. Uh, the Spicer 18 is very prone to leaking and there's a few things we can do to combat that. So this is the front output yoke that I removed from the transmission. And if you can see, right around there is a very deep groove. This groove is what often causes the transfer case to leak. The seal will ride right in that groove and even if you put a brand new seal on here, it'll get torn up or just not create a tight seal and it will leak over time. They do make something called speedy sleeves and a lot of people like to use them. That's where you are um, pressing a very thin piece of metal over this. Um, they're difficult to install and from my experience, um, it just doesn't they don't often work and they're not cheap. So what I do is just buy a new yoke from Kaiser Willys. You can see this seal surface is perfectly machined and ready to go. This will solve probably 80% of your leaking problems on your transfer case. Same goes for the rear flange. This one isn't as bad but it still has a groove that my fingernail is catching and some pitting especially if these sit or you drive in water a lot. Um, Kaiser Willys offers the rear flange as well. It's a direct replacement. Comes preloaded with the felt dust shield and will really help dry up your <laughs> garage floor underneath your Jeep. I like to begin with the bearing retainer housings. We're going to install the seals um, for the shift rails and for the output yokes. Before you do that, just like with everything else on this build, um, prep is really important. So if you notice there's no paint inside here, a little bit of overspray won't hurt, but if you have a lot of buildup of paint, your seal's not going to fit right. There is a paper gasket that gets dropped in the front and the rear. So you put that in there and that's where we start. One of the big reasons I see these transfer cases leaking are because these seals are installed improperly. Um, sometimes they're smashed, sometimes they're backwards. So if you fold this out, I don't know if you can see in there, there's a silver spring. On a seal like this, the spring always goes towards the oil. So that means the seal would go in that way. Same exact thing for these little guys. The spring goes towards the oil, so it would go like this. And like that. If you're going to use a socket to drive your seal in, at least use one that fits as close to the outside edge as you can while still fitting down inside the housing. So while this tool is not ideal, this is totally acceptable and if you do it correctly will yield good results. After doing many of these I kind of ditched the socket method and turned down a very large piece of steel stock that fits just inside the housing. So as you can see, this is a really massive piece of steel. It is not fancy, but boy does it do the job and it really prevents misshaping that seal. All right, let's get started. I like to put down a piece of aluminum first that prevents marring the uh, surface, the machine surface on the back. Next up is your paper gasket. That should drop right down in there. And then the seal, making sure that the spring side is facing the oil. As I was saying earlier, it's really important that you drive this in straight. If you have a press, you can 100% 
use the press as well or just take your time and strike it really even. Once you know it's going straight, just drive it home. Take your time, it's okay to pull your tool off and make sure you're not bending or denting it in any way. As you're driving it down in, eventually you'll feel and hear a change and that means it's all the way. Moving on to the front housing, same exact procedure. Little paper gasket, oil seal with the spring facing the oil. Get it started straight and drive it home. Great success. Nice and straight. The front isn't marred up and you can look in the back and verify that it's tight against our paper gasket. Moving on to the shift rail seals. That's these little guys. They are exactly the same. Make sure your spring is facing the oil. They go in like that. Um, I just use a socket for this. Um, I've found this uh, three quarter inch impact socket fits perfect. These are much more delicate, so you don't want to go too crazy on them. Um, because it's very easy to bend them. So just little taps like that, stopping to make sure they're going in straight. These go in much easier. And you will feel it bottom out after a bit. So I don't know if you could hear that pitch change and that one's bottomed out and that's it there's no paper gasket under these for the next part i'm going to move to the front bearing housing we're going to load this up with all the parts uh, first part is the ball bearing this comes with your kit some bearings will have a snap ring groove on the outside uh, that doesn't matter if you're if it does there's no right or wrong way it can go either way the groove doesn't matter um, so you're just going to line this up and you're going to drive it in. Sometimes they slip right in. It's important that you clean up the bore of this. It's just a slip fit. So as long as it's straight, it'll pop right in there. So I'm just using a little brass drift. Very light taps. Only hit on the outside race. And it actually just fell in there. You'll know it's in all the way when it exposes the snap ring groove. Follow up the bearing with the snap ring. It just uh, gets worked into that groove. You can generally do this with your fingers and a flathead screwdriver. So once you get the first corner in, just take a screwdriver. It's okay to pry gently on this. And um, there's a little cutout in the housing right there that helps. And just kind of use a screwdriver and your finger and work it down in just like that and as it goes into the groove you should hear a nice satisfying snap next up is the front output this is a little four-wheel drive stub shaft and just fish that right through what i do now is take a brass hammer just like that don't hit this with steel, use brass. It's not a very tight fit and you're good to go. Time to install the shift rail for the four wheel drive. Uh, it's very important that you clean off all the rust and dirt off of the shift rails because we have to press these through the seal. Also, um, if you have any burrs on here at all, I would take some uh, emery cloth or a file and just make this nice and smooth. I even um, cut down this edge a little bit, both of these edges, because there's times where you might need to take this in and out of the seal. And if this is sharp or rough in any way, it can cut the seal. This is the shift clutch for the four wheel drive output shaft, the front output. And this is the smaller shift fork. So this is the orientation that it goes in. I like to put a little drop of oil on the front edge of this and from the back side you have to keep this together as it goes in uh, this is going to go through this little hole here and you have to keep this piece in if this falls out as you push that through the seal you got to pull it out and do it again 
take a pick. You don't want to just force this through the seal, um, but you also want something smooth that's not going to cut the seal because these can actually get inverted or tear. So I'm just kind of turning it and applying real light pressure there and it just popped right through. If you're choosing to keep your Jeep completely original, this would be the time that we would reinstall the interlock pill. So that would be dropped right in here like that and it goes between the two shift rods. So you have to do it right now before this other shift rail goes in. If you're interested in having two wheel drive low range, you would leave this out. But one thing you will need to do is install the detent balls and springs. So I like to put a little oil on them and you just drop one down each side. Then the spring, I oil that up as well. It'll all get gear oil once it's together, but it's good to put a little lubricant on it right now. And thread your plug in, snug them right down. And we're just doing the one side for now because obviously the other one, the shift rail's not in there and if we put it in, it would just fall through. Next on the list is to prepare the main shaft. Your kit will come with a pilot bushing. That goes in this end of the main shaft so it'll get pressed into here. Um, it's totally up to you if you'd like to replace that. I check them with a micrometer and checked fitment with the actual shaft. And if these are not worn, it's totally acceptable to leave the original one in there. Time to reinstall the high and low range shift rail. So if you notice the little dimple, that's what this locking bolt goes into. So that's the piece that goes in first. We are on the outer hole. So if you remember, there's two holes here, the rod goes in the outer one and it will pass through there. It just slides right on there, just like that. When we remove this bolt, if you notice it has a hole in it here, that's for the safety wire. Um, I generally don't safety wire these back in. If you have safety wire and you want to do that, that's great. I just clean it up really well and put red Loctite on it. It is a 3 8 square and I make this fairly tight. This is the correct orientation. So you know you have it right if you can just get a socket on it like that. Now it's time to assemble the main shaft. You're going to need the uh, gear that is smooth on the inside, a snap ring, and then the large splined gear and the bearing. Both of these bearings are the same, so the front and rear bearing are interchangeable. You don't have to worry about mixing them up. So we're going to start with um, the rear bearing. So that's this side with the threads. So I just set this on something soft. Then you take your bearing with the cone facing up like that and set it right down there. So we have to press it on and this is a press fit. Um, it's about three quarters of an inch. So if you have a press, you can throw it in there. If you don't, find a piece of pipe or something that fits only on the inner race. So I'm gonna show you this backyard garage style. Um, you do not want to hit on the outer race at all. That will destroy the bearing. Give her a few wax. Make sure it's going on straight. You'll know it's on there all the way when there is no more gap right here. Everything should be spinning smooth. Okay, time to assemble. So, remember the, the rail on that gear goes towards the back and it'll slide right down into that shift fork. So that's our first piece. Then with the front facing forward, line up the splines. And at the same time, we're gonna bring this gear in and put it all, put the shaft through the whole assembly like that. So now you can kind of see what's going on here. So we have this gear on there the input or the main shaft 
and everything's kind of just flopping around, but now it's, it's to where we can work with it. Next up is that thrust washer. So that will be slid down from the top. And remember I said there's only one position it can go in, so as long as it goes all the way down beyond that snap ring groove, you know you have it in the right spot. Then take your snap ring and you can get it started over there by hand and I get it to, uh, to about that point and then there's a little shoulder there and you have to get snap ring pliers and expand it. Just spread it with your snap ring pliers and then you'll hear that lovely click. Now it's time to press or drive the top bearing. I guess this will be the front bearing. It's on top just the way I have it sitting here onto the shaft. So it's the exact same procedure as before. I have something down here protecting the threads and everything's supported so I'm not driving on the gear or the snap ring. When I hit, it's gonna be transferred into this piece. Um, this stuff's just kind of floating there and I also have the nut to protect the threads. Once again, make sure you're only hitting on the inner race. And drive it on. Next up, I'm taking the outer race and putting a little bit of assembly lube on it and sliding it into the top of the case. Make sure you do not use a steel hammer on that part. Spin the case around to the back side. Take the outer race with a little more lube on it and slide it right over. You'll have to lift up on the shaft and push it towards the front so it's not hitting the bearing. And you can kind of support everything and using your brass hammer again, tap the outer race into the housing. It is now time to do everybody's favorite part and that's put all these loose needle bearings inside the intermediate gear. So washer a row of needles, another washer, row of needles, and then another washer. So you'll see washers on both ends and there's a row in here, top and bottom with a washer on the inside. So um, get your favorite type of assembly grease, make sure it's nice and cold. That's the only way to really hold everything together because then we have to put this gear in the case and keep it all together. Everyone has their own preferred method of doing this. I just start with a glob of grease around the inside and start throwing some bearings in there. Since we only have uh, two rows and it's only about three inches tall, it's not hard at all to reach everything in there. So it's cold in my shop. So this is kind of a good time of year to do this. It holds everything together. So. Um, I'm not going to document this whole thing <laughs> because it's going to take a little time, but um, this is how you do it. This is how I do it. You're just getting these needles to stick in that grease and going all the way around. There should be no gaps. So if you get to the end and there's a little bit of a gap and you're like, oh, I can't quite tell if I have them all, this should be pretty tight. Keep it nice and straight. Don't be afraid to add a little more grease. I also get a lot of people commenting, um, you know, there is special assembly grease for this that um, dissolves in ear oil. But I can tell you one thing, I've been using regular grease to do this my entire life and I've yet to have a problem from that. And I've also never seen any of it when I change my oil I've put a lot of miles on Spicer 18s, um, and you can bet, you know, the GIs out in the field weren't like, oh, I'm waiting for Amazon to get here with my special grease before we can put this transfer case back together. So, in a perfect world, that's great. If you have it, use it, but don't um, bust on the mechanic who's just out there trying to get it back together to get on the trail with his buddies tomorrow. 
because I can personally tell you, you will have no problems from just using regular old grease to do this. And if you're very concerned about that, you can always dump the oil after a little while and check it, but you'll probably never think of it and you'll never have a problem with it again. So there, that's my two cents. So, during the story time, I got one row all the way around. That's what it looks like. If you did it right with this kit, I wasn't sure because some kits come with extra ones. Um, the exact number of needles were in there. So um, the last one is a little bit of a challenge. I mean, sometimes they're tight. Sometimes sliding it in from the end is best. So I have a washer on both sides and a washer down the row in the middle. Next up, we're going to install these thrust washers that come with the kit. Uh, if you notice, there's a little tab that is pressed through and that's what keeps these from spinning. There is a corresponding tab on both sides of the transfer case. The brass faces inward so it's going to look like this. Brass inward and that's the bearing surface that rides against the intermediate gear. Take some of that forbidden grease that we shall not use for assembly and smear it on there. Line it up with the brass facing inward and make sure that little notch is in there because if it's not it'll actually um, you know kind of hold this out from the case and not allow you to get the intermediate gear in. So you can put the grease on either the washer or the case whatever you want and it's nice and cold so it will stick just great and kind of give it a little wiggle. I have found um, this part to actually be a little more challenging than putting the needle bearings in because as you, it's kind of a tight fit and as you're sliding it down in there um, these washers often push out of the way so I keep a pick nearby so I can um, you know move the, the washer sometimes they slide down so if you have a pick or something you can push it up I don't have a ton of trouble with the needles falling out which is what most people um, think will happen I'm putting assembly lube on the intermediate shaft you can put a little bit in the bore if you want um, there are o-rings that come with your kit and they're very easy they just pop right over there there's one on each end and that helps with uh, oil seepage so just kind of greasing her up good um, it's important to it's just easier if you kind of keep the location of this notch in mind as you're sliding it in here if it's off a little bit you can usually tap it or spin it but you want to keep it as close to where it belongs as possible and I'm just kind of carefully sliding this down in the case the shaft will hold this washer up and I'm going to use my finger on the front side to hold the other washer up oh. sometimes they fall down trying to be as realistic as possible I've done a lot of these and still sometimes it doesn't go as planned so you can also put your hand in through the PTO cover it's very easy to tell which way the gear goes because it only fits one way you might have to spin things a little bit um, I look through from this side and I can see the washers are in place and lined up um, I will only use a rubber mallet on this and if you notice I'm just very lightly tapping so as I'm tapping I'm gonna spin it around here this side is uh, the washer tends to fall down if it does just get a, a screwdriver and if you rock the gear you'll be able to push that washer right back up so I'm gonna keep tapping this through and I'll come back once I get it all lined up all right this is kind of an exciting part the last little bit will be tight because this is more of like a pressed fit continue to drive it in until this portion of the intermediate shaft is completely flush with the case 
<clears throat> then the locking tab will go in place and this 516 bolt this hole does not need sealant because it does not go through to where the oil is here's the view from the other side good to go I'm pretty much done on the inside so I'm going to install the oil pan we have to flip the transfer case over now and I don't really want to um, bang the gears into the workbench and slide them around and things like that so we're done in here it's gonna get sealed up I'm gonna take some um, solvent and clean this gasket surface on both sides I always like to do that um, because you know we're touching it with our hands getting it all greasy so some denatured alcohol on a rag clean up both surfaces and get ready to seal it up the next part is personal preference I like to take my finger and apply a thin coat of ultra gray to both sides so to the oil pan and the case not a lot just a little bit and that helps hold the gasket in place and also gives you a little bit of extra protection set the gasket in place line up all the holes set the oil pan on I have a thin coat of gray goop on that as well grab your bolts then I just use my impact not to snug it up just to save time and make sure you start all the bolts before you tighten them down because this can shift a little bit I use the impact gun just to eat up the threads but I always tighten these by hand time to install the front bearing housing onto the case so once again make sure both services are as clean as possible that will ensure a good seal just as I did with the oil pan I have a light coat of gray on both sides don't overdo it and I try to only get it where the gasket sits so it's not squirting out all over all right nothing too crazy here the biggest thing is uh, just like with the other shift rail we have to be careful feeding that one through the seal and do your best not to smear your silicone so I'm gonna get it right to this point again and grab my pick and just kind of make sure that my seal isn't getting wrecked and right about the time that starts to engage your pilot on the front output shaft will engage okay so both shift rails are through there's five bolts that hold this together this top left one doesn't go into the transfer case so I usually put that one in first because I'm not worried about sealing it the rest of them you're going to want to put some sort of sealant on them because they will see oil for the rest of the bolts I don't do anything fancy just more of the ultra gray just like that that's all I do it's worked well for me for many moons all five bolts are snugged up and if you remember we still had one detent ball left now that the shift rails in there it is time so ball then the spring oil and snug that cap up once you tighten up all five bolts and you have the other detent ball and cap installed 
spin it around. We really only have one thing left to do before we install the shifters and PTO cover, and that is to install the rear bearing retainer and set the uh, end play on the rear output shaft. So now that I'm done rolling this thing around, I can take the nut off. I'm not worried about bashing it up. And through the process of installing that front cover, my uh, rear bearing race kind of fell out. So gently tap that back in place and clean up this surface. Don't be intimidated by this process. It's really not difficult at all. Um, you'll notice when you disassembled your transfer case, there were several of these shims varying in thickness. And all they do is control how far towards the case, you know, the distance between this surface and that surface. So by taking out shims, it gets tighter. By adding shims, it gets looser. You will need a dial indicator um, with a magnetic base to do this by the book. Um, so it, these, these aren't expensive, and if you don't have one, just get on Amazon or borrow one. It's good to have around, so I definitely would recommend uh, having one of those on hand. Don't put any sealant or anything on these until we're all done, um, because you might be taking it on and off multiple times. I like to start with whatever amount of shims I removed and I don't remember so it's better <laughs> to start um, kind of thick and take shims away as you go. So I'm just going to take a wild guess at what was on here. We'll put some shims in here, put the bolts in here and snug this up. The cover's on, it's dry meaning there's no sealant or anything on any of the bolts or the surfaces and this is snugged up nice and tight and everything still spins good and if you listen closely the shaft moves back and forth so that means we're in the ballpark with our shims um, if you clamp everything down and it's hard to turn and you can get you know no play back and forth it means it's too tight you need to take this off and add more shims i flipped the transfer case upside down so that i could show you the gauge a little better just based on the flat surfaces for the mag base to stick to this worked out the best so this is our, our very first test and i'm not editing anything out here this is just where that handful of shims ended up so I don't know if you can see, I'm, I'm zeroed out pretty close there. And I'm just pulling back and forth. You can't hit the other end of the shaft because there's, um, they're not connected. So you have to do everything from over here. And I don't know if you can tell, it's about nine thousands. So, and you wanna get kind of rough with it in case it's just sticking. So. I'm able to get about ten thousandths of play. So I'm at ten thousandths. Uh, the recommended uh, end play of this is between four and eight thousandths. These are new bearings, so I like to go a little bit tighter because they are going to break in a little more. So now we'll pull these four bolts off, remove a shim, and put it back together and check it again. So it's just trial and error. Um, I wanna get it down to four thousandths or pretty close to it. So I'm gonna measure my shims with a, a dial caliper and try to pull out about five thousandths worth of shim and put it back together and check it again. These shims only come in a few different thicknesses, so you're kind of um, confined to that. As you can see, this is a really flimsy one. Um, so I'm gonna take this out, just a single shim. I know it doesn't seem like much, but that's how you wanna go, baby steps. So now we put our the rest of the shims back in and check it one more time. So I don't know how well you can see that. I got it down to about five or six thousands. So I'm happy with that. Now that our end play is set on the rear output, we can get rid of the indicator, pull this back out and start cleaning everything up for final assembly. We are on the home stretch now. The last thing I do is coat all the surfaces with a very light coating of this copper spray gasket. Um, some people don't like that. 
it's worked well for me for a very long time, so I continue to do it. Um, not a lot, because you don't want to build it up to where you're actually changing the end play. Before final assembly, once you have all your shims sorted out, make sure you install your speedometer drive gear. The smooth shoulder goes towards the case, just like that. Now we can put our rear housing on. So we are now on to the final assembly. So you do want to seal the threads of these bolts because these ones do go through the case into the oily area. So you want a little bit of sealant of your choice on the threads of these bolts. I'm snug it up this time and hopefully not have to take it apart again until the next rebuild when your grandchildren start to hear a little growling many moons from now. Funny story, while I'm finishing this up, um, these shims, these little guys, always count how many you have and which ones they are. Like really be careful where you put them and um, specifically the number. Um, because <laughs> the very first one of these I built, I was uh, cleaning them and I put the copper spray gasket on them and I hung them in my mom's lilac bush out in the backyard and um, I, I put it back together and I thought I got them all and about five years later I don't know what I was doing in the backyard but I was looking <laughs> in that lilac bush and lo and behold there was a transfer case shim with the uh, copper gasket stuff still on there. I had little um, like coat hanger hooks I made to you know dry spray paint parts and stuff. And it was still hanging out in that bush and it was uh, not in the transfer case. And I ran that transfer case for about 15 years um, with the improper preload. So that goes to tell you how tough these are, but also how easy it is to forget to put all the shims back in there. We are so close to being done now, it's not even funny. I know I keep saying that, but this time it's true. Take your front yoke, replace the felt, and get that ready to install. I highly recommend putting a little bit of sealant on these splines, because otherwise the oil will actually work down through the splines and leak out of the nut that goes in here and you'll be like, where is all this oil coming from? So I take a little bit of silicone and wipe it around the splines of this shaft. Once you have some silicone or sealant on the splines, just get the yoke started on there and you can use a rubber hammer like a glove. Then a washer and the nut, then torque it to 37 Ugga Duggas. Install the cotter pin and this front side is done. Now we're moving on to the fun part. We're going to install the shifters and the anti-rattle clips. So oh, just start those in there. Clean everything up as best you can and put a little grease on it to get things going and get those started in there. As I said earlier, you might have the different style pin that just gets pushed in with the um, locking bolt. This one is a threaded style. And don't be like me and forget a part. <laughs> so get that in there. Um, then I'll show you how I do the anti-rattle clips. These are the anti-rattle clips. If you notice, each shifter has a little notch on it and that's to lock these in place. If you put these on the wrong side of the shifter, like back here, they'll wiggle out. So the trick with these is to just put them in down here like that and bend them up over. I used to try to get it all lined up in there and uh, it's a bit of a chore, but if you do it this way, it's not too bad at all. Push it in like that and bend it. You can use a little if you need it and make sure it's down below that notch and now your sticks won't rattle.
Just as I did with the front yoke, I put a little bit of silicone around the splines of the rear yoke. If you have a regular uh, CJ2A or something with the uh, backing plate, this would be the time to reassemble your emergency brake backing plate. This is an M38A1 style transfer case, so um, similar, just slightly different uh, brake setup. Once you get this uh, flange on far enough to start your nut and washer, then you can just use um, this nut to draw it the rest of the way into the case. Excellent job, you've just successfully rebuilt a Spicer 18 transfer case. The only thing left to do is install the drive gear washer and nut that goes on the back of the transmission through the PTO cover when you install it. Then top it off with the correct lubricant. The way you do this on a Spicer 18 is to remove this plug on the side and simply fill it full of oil until the oil runs back out. Kaiser Willys is a one-stop shop. They also have the correct lubricant for the Spicer 18. This is Brad Penn gear oil this is a 90 weight GL4, so it's yellow metal safe, so it won't damage your thrust washers and the bronze bushing inside the input shaft. The Spicer 18 holds just about two quarts, and uh, this will keep you going down the road for a long time. I just wanted to mention all the methods I used in today's video, I use on all of my Jeeps uh, as far as sealing them from leaking. I built this transfer case in 2017, and probably has about 10,000 miles on it. It's been sitting here for several weeks and there's not a drop on the ground. That little dark spot is from my other Jeep which has a completely different transfer case in it. So what we did today might seem different from what you've heard or seen or tried, but um, I wouldn't tell you to do this if I didn't have complete faith in it. And yes, there is oil in there. Make sure you check out the links in the description to Kaiser Willys products. They're great parts and service, and I couldn't have done this video without them. I hope you found this video helpful. Let me know any feedback you have in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Catch you later.